Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for all coming in from your lunch and for joining us while we have a short presentation about Sangamo. I took over as the CEO of Sangamo on the 1st of June from Edward, who I'm sure many of you know, and who was the founder CEO and a great stalwart of this organisation. And the board had decided it was time for a, for a new direction, and they wanted someone with more of a development experience. And we decided that instead of, just decide, instead of just launching ahead with my vision, that we would take the time to go out to investors and to partners and ask them what they thought about Sangamo and what it is that they thought that Sangamo should look like in the future. And they said very clearly a, a few things. As a positive, they said we had fantastic scientists and they said we had a unique technology. But they also said that we had failed to deliver on that promise that um, we didn't have a clear strategy and we hadn't communicated it well. So it means I have a very clear mandate of what we need to do and we have the full support of the board moving ahead. And one of the things you do when you take over a company is you, is you put together a mission statement. You try and decide who you are and why you're here. And these often use very similar words and if you look at other companies you'll find similar words because it's the kind of thing that is important and inspires a company. But I want to take the time just to read this one to you. We're committed to translating groundbreaking science into genetic therapies that transform patients' lives. And this is going to address a bit about a strategy and the communication. And I want to tease apart three bits of this. The first is the groundbreaking science. Now, when you take on a new job, as all of you know, you find things that aren't as good as you'd hoped and things that are better than you hoped. And at Sangamo, what I found that was the most inspiring for me was the science. It is better than I hoped, and I think it's better than most people realise. With the froth of CRISPR and the excitement around gene editing, to go and find a technology that's been developed slowly and carefully over 20 years by a group of scientists, many of whom have dedicated their lives to it. And we recently had a scientific advisory board, and the scientists showed me 27 different projects they'd been working on, which showed how we can apply zinc fingers to very specific and special problems. Of course we'll have to um, focus that down, but it, it speaks to the energy within the group. An example of one of the things that they showed me is, is a, a mutation called LCA10, which is a, a, a genetic disease of the eye that one of the other companies is going for and can achieve a 15% editing on. And the scientists uh, at Sangamo managed to edit this with an 85% effectiveness with minimal off-target as a Friday afternoon project because they thought it was interesting. And it really does speak to the effectiveness and the utility of zinc fingers. But then the second bit is translating that science into, ground, into genetic therapies. And we haven't been as good as that as we should be. And we need to recruit a clinical group who will make sure that we take that science and bring it into patients and we gather the clinical data that you're all waiting for. Next year, we'll have four things in clinical studies. These will be the first time for three of them that a new gene has been put into a human being, into the liver. And that really is fundamental groundbreaking science that organizations like ARM should be proud of, um, nurturing and growing and bringing together companies that believe that this is important. And then the final thing is transform patients' lives. I thoroughly believe, and you probably heard me saying in the panel yesterday, that we need to be very careful that the diseases we address are important and that genetic therapies are the appropriate and necessary treatment for those diseases. What we're doing is irreversible. It is something at the cutting edge of science and therefore we need to choose very carefully which diseases are appropriately treated by those therapies. So we're blessed and I'm blessed because I, I have a 20-year-old company that's now behaving like a four-month-old startup and has four things in clinic. And we've said clearly to the, to the world that we will um, initiate the phase one, two trial for factor nine this year, that we will um, file the, the IND for the factor eight, that we will early next year initiate the trials for MPS1 and MPS2, Hunters and Hurlers syndrome, that we will tell the world about our HIV therapy at the beginning of next year, and that we will continue our partnership with Biogen, a company that, that's going through transition itself, for thalassemia and sickle cell disease. 
and that we'll continue our partnership with Sharp, where I, I wish I could tell you more about this, but this is the coolest bit of genetic engineering that I have seen since I came to the company. But let me just take you into our core technology. We are a zinc finger company, and we can either do zinc editing, gene, genome editing, or gene regulation. And one of the things I'm challenging the team to do is not just to um, emulate gene therapy or what CRISPRs do, but work out where it is that the accuracy of uh, zinc fingers allows things that no one else can do. We can target every base or second base in, within the genome, as opposed to CRISPR that requires 8 to 32 base pair stretches of, of DNA and requires a PAM sequence recognition that we don't. So we are best for things where you really need accuracy rather than just being in the zip code. And through some of the advances that the team have done over these years, they can now drive down off target to levels that are um, um, at baseline compared to baseline interventions. And I think what we would like to do is to start opening the discussion about what is the right level of cutting, what is the right level of off target, and what are the standards that we as a gene editing and gene therapy organization should be aiming for. But we don't look on zinc fingers as a, a religion, and we don't look as sang at Sangamo as only having one tool in its toolbox. And because we have such bright molecular biologists, what we discovered was many of the things they were doing are equally applicable to gene therapy. And I'm going to talk a little in the next section about haemophilia A, where a very smart scientist in our organization, Bridget, has managed to do some remarkable genetic engineering to, to what we think, create what we think is the, the, um, the most competitive of the uh, factor eight gene therapy. But before I get there, I'd like to talk a little about MPS one and two. These are the model for what we're going to do where we drop a new gene into the albumin locus of the liver. We use the zinc fingers to uh, identify an intron within the albumin gene. We make a cut with the uh, FOC1 enzyme, and we drop in a transgene. In this case, the enzymes are deficient in Hunter's or Hurler's syndrome. What we do gives a permanent integration and hopefully will allow constant production of enzyme for these children. I say children because that's the eventual goal for, for what we're doing. To be prudent, we start in adults. So the opening trials will be in people of 18 and older because they can consent, and that is the right thing to do. Once we have got enough safety information and have opened discussions with the agency, our eventual goal is to, to move this into children. So as, as early on as possible, we can provide a solution for, for patients who otherwise have no alternative. We have information from, ad, from animals, and in this um, slide, what I show is what we see in mice. So we see plasma levels, this is for MPS1, plasma levels of the enzyme, and we see both tissue levels and the byproduct that you have to reduce in, of GAG are appropriately um, re remediated in all of the tissues, in liver, heart, and lung, and most interestingly in brain. This was something we didn't really expect because one always worries about proteins crossing the blood-brain barrier. But before I, I talk about blood-brain barrier, I'd like you to look on the histology on the left-hand side. What this shows is, um, I, can't, I can't see without my glasses. What this shows is tissue vacuolation, which is pathognomonic of what happens in these diseases. And it compares the wild type, the normal, with MPS1 control, the animal model, and then with the animal model treated with the zinc finger. And the vacuolation that these um, filled with, um, um, that, that disrupt the function of the organ has been re completely remediated by the zinc finger. And that's the zinc finger within the liver providing the enzyme th from the albumin locus and the albumin promoter, the enzyme being taken up by the tissues. And that's very encouraging but the one on the right is the one I want to take a minute or two, and I want to put a caveat around this. Having done neuroscience development in, in other places, animal models of neuroscience are very difficult to interpret. But what we have here is a Barnes maze, which is you put an animal 
on a, on a maze and, a li and shine a bright light on it. And if the animal's smart, it escapes through the one hole. And at certain cues, it takes it to the one hole. And as you do this repeatedly, the animal realizes where these cues are and escapes from the, the situation and the bright light and the predator, it thinks, quicker. If you look at uh, uh, animals with, which model the MPS1 disease, they don't learn this and they remain equal. They take some, uh, the same time to escape from the, the maze. And you can see that on the green bars where the MPS1 control remains at about 150 seconds. What is fascinating to us if, is if you look at the other two curves, with the grey being the wild type control and the blue being the MPS treated with our zinc finger model, is that something is happening. And it's rare to see an, uh, a maze model where there's such a tight result, where the difference between the control is so clear and that the treated mimics the wild type. Now, we need to be careful not to overpromise this to patients because it's, it really is the neuro, neurological deficit that they want to address. But it gives us great promise that some of the protein that is being produced on a chronic basis by this transgene in the liver is able to address some of the neurological deficits, at least in the mice. And we'll be following this up carefully in, uh, in the human studies, which, as I say, will start next year. But then the second one is, is factor eight, and this is a much more conventional gene therapy using our AAV6, where you have an episomal um, uh, formation within the liver and the production of the enzyme. I've told the team that we shouldn't just do gene therapy just to do gene therapy. We should only attempt this and, and use this as a place we're going to go if we can be better. Because other people can do it, and it isn't our secret sauce. But Bridget came up with a version of Factor 8 in, in our, our vector that is, just seems to be better than anyone else's. She did codon optimization of the, of the um, part of the gene. She optimized the promoter. She optimized the three-pime sequence. And I want to show you two things just as I bring this talk to an end. The first is, if you look at the doses here, they are remarkably low viral loads. The second thing is, is if you look at the tightness about each point, there is very little variability looking across the various doses. And I think if we think of the BioMarin data that came out recently, where it went from zero and then suddenly went to 10 to, I think it's 200%, that's something you need to be very careful of because a, a doctor wants to be able to give a patient a dose that is predictable. But if we try and put this into perspective, and I want to give a caveat here and give credit to Biomarin and the work that they've done getting into patients and the f being first to do that, which I, again is, is leading the field. What I've done is I've plotted the Biomarin data and then added the Sangamo data, and it is it's approximately a log difference. And that potency is important because it means we can use less virus, we can be th more thoughtful about whether we use steroids or hopefully not. And then putting that in context with the SPARC data, we believe that we have the most potent in non-human primates factor eight. So we're going to drive ahead and we're going to put in a, an IND this year and drive forward with that trial next year. We're going to be pragmatic, we're going to take it to an inflection point and we're going to make the right decision whether it's us or somebody else that takes us forward. But we're blessed in having three zinc finger projects and one gene therapy project in the clinic next year which means that we've taken the science and we've translated it into patients, which means that we've gone through all that bit about creating an IND, which I, I'm sure you all know is complicated and, and takes time. And we've learned how to manufacture at clinical scale. So if, what I want you to take away from all of this is Sangamo is evolving. We are, we are no longer a platform, but we, it is a platform that we're proud of. We're a therapeutics company that translates groundbreaking science, because that's what we're going to focus on, into genetic therapies that will transform patients' life. I'm very fortunate that Edward ensured that I have a strong balance sheet, but we're prioritizing our resources because we want to make sure that we're successful in the, in the clinical studies that are moving ahead. And our multi-platform approach, where we will do whatever is right 
from a genetic point of view to meet the needs of patients will generate significant shareholder value. But as a doctor, to me, the most important thing is it will address unmet medical need. So I'll stop there and answer any questions. Yes. Uh, if you shout as loud as possible. I didn't hear, I didn't, like, I didn't see what the ad note of the virus was. AAV6. That's a complicated, and that's a complicated story that, that actually needs better, better discussion because I think the literature says that all of them are about a third, 20, 30 percent, but I think it's how you measure it, and there's no standard way to how you measure it. So one of the things we're going to do is, is look across all of the adenoviruses in one system so as we have a better understanding of how they all rate. And that's the other thing we're going to do. So I'm, we're going to do three things. We're going to look at the different adenoviruses and the rates for each one. We're going to look at the overlap and draw that Venn diagram because it would be great if patients had an option to go into a second one. And the third one is we're going to do it by age because I'm sure that the rates must be much lower in children. So if, you, if we can look in children, it may be that there's more people that are for whom the treatment is available. And, and that's, that's an important question because the zinc finger, one of the reasons we believe so much in zinc fingers, you have permanent expression. Nobody knows how long gene therapy is going to last. Is it five years? Is it 10 years? Who knows where we'll be in five years or 10 years? But it's a very important question. But your gene therapy is just like gene therapy, right? The, the factory is gene therapy just like bimarins and sparks, and each one of them, we don't know how long it's going to last. Any last questions before I pass on to the next? Thank you very much. I'm getting the pull from the end.